Hello, I'm Ray with another Sunday episode all about being late for school and the big I am. Do you know people who have always been the big I am? No matter what job they've got, they pretend they're something they're not. Anyway, more of that later. Two degrees. It's Friday morning, two degrees centigrade. Struth, lovely day, sunny sky, blue sky, but really, really cold. No wind. Cherry trees losing or just, to, no, there's still a few leaves left. So let's get started. Lots of stuff to chat about, especially all your emails. I mentioned, must be a week or two ago, about being late for school. Do you remember that? My mother being late for school. I've never had so many emails from you all. It's fantastic. Loads of emails about your school, not just being late, but your experiences at school from what you remember in various eras. So we go back to the the 50s. I think there's a couple from the 40s. I'll have to check all the emails. Uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, even up to the current day. How about that? An email from someone that's actually still at school today. So that's fantastic. Let's start off with the one today. Natalie, hello to you. Right, you're still at school. This is brilliant. Thank you for your email. School, right, you say from what you have seen and heard on the old episodes that I've done and what you've seen on the telly, old films about school, it's very, very different. You don't have a blackboard. In fact, you had to ask what a blackboard was. Uh, Natalie was watching some film with her mum and they mentioned blackboard. She said, what's that, blackboard? Because they have whiteboards now and they have computer screens that uh, Natalie is telling me. When did I last go into a school classroom? I think when the grandchildren uh, were at primary school. So it's a good while ago. And they even had computer, uh, a screen, not a computer screen, whatever it was. There wasn't a blackboard there. So no blackboard, no inkwells, of course, uh, Natalie, you don't mention that. (laughs) When I was at school, initially in the primary school, we had inkwells and you dip the pen in with the nib. Uh, You dip the pen in the inkwell. and (laughs) No, I wasn't born in sort of 1860, honestly. This is the 50s, when I must have been, I don't know, six, seven, eight, when we're learning to write. Never did learn to write. <laughs> I can't do joined up writing. Shows how good my school was. I blame the pen. I blame the pen and the inkwell. I actually picked my inkwell up out of the desk. You know, it plopped into a little hole in the desk. And I thought it was empty. And the chap next to me, I thought I'll frighten him. And I said, hey, I'll have some ink. I thought I'd frighten him by pretending to empty it over his shirt. So I, I tipped it up sort of pointed it towards him so the ink would go all over his shirt and it wasn't empty, there was some in the bottom and it went all over his clean white shirt. Struth, he cried, told the teacher, oh, miss, 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 he'd poured ink all over me and she didn't know, she didn't believe him. She said, oh, come on, what have you done with your inkwell? And I'm sitting there looking, well, looking guilty, I suppose, thinking, oh, oh, here we go, Uh -uh. epic fail. (laughs) I didn't think epic fail. Didn't have epic fail back then. I don't know what I thought. I was worried. I thought, here we go. I'm going to be in trouble. Anyway, she told him off. How come you've got ink all over your shirt? And she, the lad was saying, he did it. He did it. And she said, don't be ridiculous. Go and clean up. <laughs> so I got away with that. And in the playground, he told me off. He said, that's not very nice. You should have admitted your guilt. I remember his words. For eight years old, I thought, ooh, that's posh. Should have admitted your guilt. Oh, and when a girl sat next to me another time, we had these wax crayons. I took one of her crayons and I snapped it in half. I was just testing it to see how strong it was. Oh, miss, 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 he snapped my crayon in half. And she said, what do you mean he snapped it in half? What have you done? And this girl got told off. So again, I got away with being naughty. Wasn't I awful? In my defence, I didn't mean to snap it in half. You know, when they get warm, the wax crayons, you can bend them. I was warming it in my hands and I was trying to bend it and tink, there it went into two pieces. So I gave it back to her in half. I don't know. I don't know. School wasn't all dreadful. Actually, it was. I hated it. Now, Natalie, you say you use Christian names. So you'd be Natalie and your teacher. Do you call your teacher Christian name? I think that's what you're implying here, reading your email. Oh, oh, we didn't. It was Miss and Sir. And they called us by our surnames. Smith. Get away from that. What are you doing there? Johnson, stop that. (laughs) That was funny. Or you boy. That was the main one I got. You boy, what are you doing? Uh, Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. 
I'm just being innocent. <laughs> I don't know. It has changed, though. It really has changed. Going back to Natalie, she says, do you have Christmas plays? Yeah, we did. They were called, well, they're not festivities. What was the Christmas play? Nativity, wasn't it? I had to, I was an angel once. <laughs> Can you believe me, an angel? Me of all people. That's when I was about, I don't know, six or seven. We had this ridiculous nativity play thing. The parents came to have a look. I had to stand there with this angel's outfit. I mean, I looked like a girl. <laughs> I don't know what my parents thought. They probably thought it was good. Probably thought, oh, look, Mummy's little soldier. I wanted to be a little soldier, not an angel. Yeah, we did, Natalie. We had Christmas plays. Um, I remember one. We had a kind of Christmas party on the very last day of school, a Christmas party where we had fizzy drinks and biscuits and, I don't know, bits of cake and what. Oh, we had to watch a film. That's right, on the last afternoon of school, you know, before we got the Christmas holiday, we had to watch a film. I forget what they were about, some rubbish. The old projector going at the back of the hall, da -da 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 -da. lights all dimmed, half the kids messing about. I don't think anyone watched the film. We're all messing about because it's sort of semi-dark. We couldn't be seen properly by the teachers, so we're all mucking about. Now, this is surprising. Uh, Natalie says, some Saturday mornings they have to go into school. Now, oh, I've never heard of that. Well, I have. I have some private schools do that. Do you go to a private school, I wonder? I think you must do. I don't think the state schools get kids in on a Saturday morning. This is for lessons. I'm reading it here. This is for lessons. Extra lessons and catching up and stuff like that. And that is instead of... Ah, oh, that's interesting. That's instead of homework. So you get a little bit of homework sometimes. That's what she's saying. But basically you go in on a Saturday morning. Struth. I think if they'd done that at my school, there'd have been a riot. There'd have been a revolution. <laughs> Can you imagine us? Well, no. I mean, I didn't go in Friday afternoons, let alone Saturday mornings. I don't know. That is interesting. Let me know, uh, Natalie. Let me know if that's a private school or not. I think you must be at a... Yeah, you can't be a state school doing that. Be interested to know. A friend of mine showed me something the other day. He emailed me with this picture and he said... If you're wondering what's on at Christmas this year, uh, on the BBC, that is, let me know, because I've got a 1982 copy of the Radio Times, <laughs> implying that it's all repeats. It is. It's all repeats, isn't it? I'm surprised that this year the BBC aren't going to put on Morecambe and Wise from 1966. <laughs> Stuff like that. They do. They have repeats. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. Oh, another thing to throw in. Do you remember Janet... The lady with uh, rude comments that used to email me. I couldn't read them all out to you. I've just heard from her. Living in Spain, met a lovely chap, hopes to get married, and she says there won't be... A <laughs> her words, not mine. Sorry, Ray, there won't be any more smutty emails. Or just as well, Janet. I had to delete. I couldn't read them. I had to delete them. Stone the crows. <laughs> anyway, good luck to you, Janet. Good luck with your boyfriend. I hope it all works out nicely for you. So thanks to you. Also, thanks to you, Natalie. I'm not going to read out your whole email. Uh, I've just taken out the, the bits that are quite relevant with what we were talking about at school. Oh, being late. We are allowed to be late within reason, she says. This is because of the traffic. There's roadworks. Just what I was saying the other day, isn't it? Traffic, roadworks train strike we've got another train strike this december what a coincidence what a coincidence isn't it the trains uh, people are going on strike next month next month is christmas now there's a coincidence it wouldn't be deliberate would it they're not deliberately going on strike to ruin everyone's christmas are they surely not one wonders anyway natalie yes you're allowed to be late obviously not all all the time every day you know that would be ridiculous but now and then, if you're late getting to school, I mean, the buses, the traffic, and mums take you to school, don't they, in their Chelsea tractors. <laughs> so there's all the traffic and the roadworks. Natalie says that the idea is that rather than the kids get to school ultra early, you know, they've left really early so as not to be late, and there's no traffic or roadworks or strikes or anything, so they get there like three quarters of an hour early. Then they're all hanging around, especially in the winter, hanging around outside, wanting to go in. So that's a good idea. A little bit of flexibility. I think that's a good idea. 
Right, quick email from John. He said you took a transistor radio to school in your blazer pocket. Yes, I did, John, and so did he. <laughs> he says what happened was one morning he was listening to it with an earphone like I had. Do you remember I said I'd, I'd pretend it was a deaf aid? <laughs> this other chap in the class, he got away with it. He always listened to his transistor radio, a little earphone in his ear, and he pretended he was deaf if the teacher said something. Sorry, what? What? Pardon? Who? <laughs> <laughs> and he's listening to his radio. So John said he got caught. One morning, he'd got his little earphone, he's listening. First thing in the morning, they're going to class, and the teacher confiscated it, which is fair enough. OK, we had that. You get it back at the end of the day. He said, the thing is, the teacher set us our work. He's sitting up there, trying to conceal his radio, got the earphone in, is listening to John's radio. He said by the time he got it back at the end of the day, he reckons the teacher listened to it all day. The battery was flat. And he said to the teacher when he got it back, he said, well, does it work? The battery's flat. Oh, I don't know about that. He did know about that. <laughs> the teacher had flattened the battery. And of course, batteries aren't cheap. What were they in those days, the little radios? Mine was a PP3. Uh, yeah, they still make those, don't they? PP3s. I remember that. And the PP9 for the bigger transistor radios, they were expensive. I remember they're about three and six. Now yeah, work that one out. Three and six back in 1950 something or other. Now, hello, Paul. Paul says at his school, I don't know when this was, Paul. You haven't said. I've no idea of your age or anything. He said at his school, they tried flexi time. Now, that, <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It didn't work. He says it didn't work. What they tried to do was stagger lessons uh you don't say why paul anyway it didn't work you can't really have flexi time at school when trish worked they had flexi time she would start at seven in the morning and she'd finish at three so in the summer of course it was lovely she'd be home at three o'clock i worked from home so i'd finish and we've got well, half the afternoon left all the evening lovely we'd have a barbecue or whatever sit out in the garden it was really nice they tried to stop it where she worked. She's retired now. They tried to stop it when she was there, and I think now they have stopped it. Now, here's the thing. If you've got to pick children up from school and you finish work at three, that's ideal. Leave work, go and get them from school. If you've got to work till five, what are you going to do? The kids have got to be picked up by someone. They've got to be taken home or looked after till you get home at, say, half five. So flexi time is good. But I can't see it working at school. Well, as you say, Paul, it didn't work. He reckons the idea was for bringing kids in, this is what I was saying, and collecting kids from school at different times. So you can get in, I don't quite know how, what they do with the lessons. I mean, if your maths lesson starts at, say, 10 o'clock in the morning and you've got people turning up late, I don't know how that would work. That's interesting, Paul. Anyway, <laughs> flexi. I was on flexi time at school. Well, not when I went there. I had to get to school more or less on time. But leaving, I was on flexi time. I could go home at lunchtime or go around the park at two o'clock, just clear off. <laughs> so I was on a, they call it truant, but I call it flexi time. Nigel, you were naughty at school. We used to sometimes go to the chip shop, which wasn't too far from where I was at school, with our dinner money. We'd go down there. Nigel and a few of his friends, they had a deal going with the the chap that worked at the chip shop. This is what he says. Is this true, Nigel? One of the lads there knew him very well. I don't know whether it was a relation or whatever. And what the chap would do, he'd get the portions for, say, say there's four of them, four portions of chips and a sausage or a bit of fish or whatever, and he'd deliver it. So they had, he'd deliver it. Let me just explain properly. The school playing field, there were sort of hedges and a fence. And this chap would at a certain time uh, each year, lunchtime, he'd be in the, in the hedges in the woods part against the fence with their fish and chips. Now, they'd prepaid with their dinner money and they'd meet him there in the sort of wooded area and grab their fish and chips, eat them in the woods. <laughs> and this happened, he said, not every day. He didn't have fish and chips every day. They did this a couple of days a week. The fish and chip man, well, he'd send his lad over and uh, into the wooded area by the school fence, the perimeter fence, and he'd hand over the, the portions of fish and chips. That's brilliant. Oh, and he says we had a cigarette afterwards. <laughs> we used to go in the bushes, not necessarily always behind the bike shed. We'd go in the bushes at school. We had quite a nice wooded area. 
where we had to play football. Oh dear. Yeah, that was awful. <laughs> anyway, that's great. Thank you for that, Nigel. That's a brilliant one. Our wooded area at school, it's where we used to go and have a cigarette. And you could see, I remember a teacher coming over once. What are you lot doing in there? And there's smoke all coming out of the bushes. The teacher said, I can see all the smoke coming out. I don't think they cared. I mean, back in the early 60s, everyone smoked. You know, kids smoked, grandparents, and brothers, sisters, mum, dad, next door neighbour. Everyone smoked, just about everyone. It was awful, actually, looking back, just how many people smoked. It was almost everyone. Whereas these days, it's the other way round. How many people smoke now? Hardly anyone. The majority is, is the other way round. You know, do you smoke? Yeah. Oh, how strange. Whereas back then, you don't smoke. Well, that's weird. <laughs> all change round. Mind you, there's all this vaping. We talked about this vaping business the other day, didn't we? I don't know about that. I don't like this vaping. They reckon, dentists reckon it's bad for your teeth. Rots your teeth or something. <laughs> I'm glad I gave up the cigarettes. Oh, never again, never again. I shouldn't have started, but I was lucky. I got away with it. Many, many people don't. Oh, that reminds me, I just had a news flash on my watch. You know, that <laughs> annoying thing. Uh, Alan said, are you going to do a countdown days till Christmas? No, I am not, Alan. I, I think he's saying that as a joke. No, I am not going to do a countdown days till Christmas. Truth. Well, leave that to the idiots on the radio. <laughs> they do that, don't they? You listen to the radio. Oh, guess what, listeners? Only so many days till Christmas. Shopping days, isn't it, normally? Just one more email, then I'll tell you a story. We haven't had a story for a long time. This email, this is from Mr. Brown, right? Eric Brown. Does anyone remember Eric Brown? He was a headmaster in the uh, early 90s. Now then, I don't know where, I don't know which school, probably best you haven't said, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> he said that he was strict but fair. He knew that kids smoked. He knew that. He said he smoked himself and he did at times scrounge cigarettes from the kids if he'd run out or send them over. This, <laughs> Eric, what sort of headmaster was you? We could have done with you at our school. You'd have been ideal. He would send a boy over to the local sweet shop to buy fags because he'd run out. <laughs> Imagine going to the local shop. Yeah, can I have uh, 20 embassy, please? <laughs> it's for the headmaster. <laughs> Dear. That's funny. Eric, what sort of headmaster were you? As I say, you should have been at our school. But he does say that he was strict, but fair. There wasn't, he didn't cane kids. He said we didn't have caning then. I don't know when that ended. Um, they're not allowed to cane kids anymore, are they? Or or smash their knuckles with a ruler and stuff like that. But he said that you know, the teachers aren't daft. He wasn't daft, the teachers weren't daft. They knew the troublemakers. They knew which ones smoked, which ones didn't, which ones were playing up, deliberately causing trouble and that sort of thing. He said a lot of the kids seem to think that the teachers haven't got a clue uh, what's going on. I think our teachers did, to be honest, Eric. Our teachers knew what was going on. Did I tell you, the maths teacher said one afternoon in his class, he said, right, you lot, if anyone wants to go out on the playing field and smoke, go now, because we're all mucking about. I don't know why, it must be coming up to summer holiday or something. We're all in a good mood, and we were mucking about in his maths class. So anyone want to go out there and smoke, go out there now and leave the others that want to learn here in peace. I don't know how many it was, maybe eight or ten of us. We went out, I went out, and we went out, out the playing field into the bushes, and had a cigarette. And after about, I suppose, 15 minutes, we're thinking, what are we going to do now? We went back. We didn't know what to do. We went back to his class. And uh, a couple of them said, sorry, sir. He said, that's all right, sit down. I suppose he thought we'd learnt our lesson, you know. It did work, actually. He was quite a nice chap. I forget his name. There were two maths teachers. One was kind of lower maths, and one was like higher maths. I was no good at it either. <laughs> I do remember his name, Mr Matthews. And the other chap's name, this might ring a few bells to anyone locally, the lower maths, as I call it, Mr Shingler. <laughs> and there was a Mr Jacobs. What did he do? Apart from yell at me most of the time. Mr West. I think Simon West, was it his name? I can't remember. He didn't like me. I don't know why. I was a, an exemplary, a perfect pupil. 
<laughs> Upright pillar of the school. Yeah, right. You believe that. You'll believe anything. Now, a story from Tina. Hello, Tina. We haven't had a story for a long, long time, have we? Tina, when she was 22, she's put here, met this chap. She worked in an office. He worked in a garage. And I don't know how old you are now, Tim. When was this? Anyway, that's beside the point, I suppose. And she started going out with him. They got on really well. But he was a little bit cagey about where he lived. And she reckoned that he was perhaps living with some girl or married and was just making out that uh, he lived alone, didn't want to take her back to his place. Eventually, he said that he lived with his mother. And of course, she's thinking, oh, yes, yeah, right, live with your mum. Yes, I've heard that before. Pull the other one. Why do they used to say, oh, pulling your leg, isn't it? Pull the other one. It's got bells on. That's <laughs> some weird old sayings, weren't they? Anyway, she thought that he was married. So she tried to find out where he lived. She knew the garage he worked at. There were only two or three people there, a small little business. So she couldn't go and ask. Yeah, they knew her. They'd seen her. She couldn't go there and say, where does he live? And she didn't know what to do apart from follow him. Eventually, this was after about six months they'd been going out together. She really liked him and she didn't want this to be bad news. Because sometimes she says that he couldn't make it. You know, I'll see you tomorrow night. Oh, I can't tomorrow, Tina. No, oh, I can't tomorrow. He'd come out with various excuses and she just didn't believe it. So she followed him home one evening when he left the garage. So she found out where he lived. She knew the address. Oh, I've missed a bit. He'd said that he lived alone. Then he said he lived with his mother. Then he said that the brother was also living there, his brother. So he kept changing his story, which he found obviously very suspicious. A couple of days later, Tina had the day off. Her boyfriend was, you haven't mentioned his name, her boyfriend was at work, so she went to the house. Knocked on the door and a middle-aged lady answered, I don't know what sort of age, it just says middle age, answered the door, and she said, is, I don't know his name, should we call him Dave? Is Dave here? And this woman said, no, he's at work. And Tina said, oh, are you his mum? And the woman said, no, I'm not his mother. No, quite, she was quite indignant. No, I'm not his mother. And there was a younger man behind this woman who came to the door, and he said to the older lady, are you OK? And the, the elderly lady said, yes, yes, this lady's... Uh, come to see Dave when he's at work and Tina said are you Dave's brother and he said what? what are you talking about anyway the woman shut the door so Tina was none the wiser she seemed to have upset the woman by saying are you his mother she was old enough to be his mother and Tina thought well that can't be his wife unless he was really into older women I did why not and I suppose the age gap doesn't always matter does it could have been his wife but she wasn't sure what was going on. When she next saw Dave, as we're calling him, Dave said, did you go round to the house today, my house? Well, she denied it. She said no. And he said, oh, apparently uh, you went to the house. My mother opened the door and you went to the house. She described you. And it was at that point that Tina said, yes, I did go round there. Now, what is going on? She says she's not your mother. You say she is your mother. I thought it was your house. He had told Tina that he owned the house. His mother lived with him and it was his house. Then the brother had moved in. All this nonsense. Stories kept changing. And what it was, it was his landlady and another tenant that was there. The chap was another tenant. They were renting rooms like bedsits. He didn't want Tina to think that he was living in a rented one room bedsit so he'd come out with all these lies and unfortunately for him he was very keen on Tina unfortunately for him that was enough of it for her she just said oh, I'm not I'm finishing with you I'm not doing this you know I'm not going to have someone that's lying to me like this you own the house that's your mother then it's your brother anyway she finished with him but that's a sad story yeah that is a sad story isn't it why do people I know a chap I know a chap who lived in a, a council house. Now, for those of you abroad, that's uh, rented, owned by the local council, and they rent out houses. And he told people it was his own house. Oh, yes, it was council, but uh, yeah, we've bought it, him and his wife, we've bought it. No one was really interested in whether it was rented or they'd actually bought it. 
Well, it came to light, it came to pass, <laughs> that we found out, one of the lads found out, that he hadn't bought it. It was rented, it was a council house. And he said to this chap, why are you going around telling people that you've bought it when you haven't? Don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone else. It is rented. He was really worried. And this chap said, well, what's the matter with you? Why are you pretending you bought it when you haven't? And he said, oh, so many of you lot own your own houses. You've got mortgages, you've bought your own houses. You don't know what it's like for me. If I want to put up a shelf, I have to ask the council, can I drill holes in the wall? If I want to do something in the garden or any changes, I have to ask the council. And he said, it's embarrassing. All you lot have got your own houses. I thought that was silly, because in the end we all knew. And he did say, oh, sorry, lads, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Why pretend like that? I don't know. I can see why, you know, he was, he wanted to be one of us lot that were uh, property owners, you know, mortgages. Funnily enough, they did buy the house in the end. This was years ago when the council used to go around, they checked the gardens, make sure you're keeping the garden nicely, make sure the house is all right. And uh, years later, his wife, him and his wife, they bought the house. So he did own his own house in the end. Actually, that uh, just reminded me. <laughs> I knew this chap years ago. We used to meet at the pub on a Sunday lunchtime, at, you know, 12 till, what were they open on a Sunday? 12 midday till two in the afternoon, they were open. Then they opened again on a Sunday, I think seven till 10. Awful draconian type laws back in those days. And this chap, we'd all meet there in the car park. We'd all take our cars there. I had my MG Magnet with the twin SU carbs and all that nonsense. And this chap had a Jag, a 4.2 litre automatic Jaguar. Wow, of course, you know, he was the talker of the, the pub. Whoa, look at that Jag. How do you afford that? Oh, well, you know, saved up for it and all this stuff. It was a lovely car. And we were all, I won't say jealous. I've never been jealous of anyone. Envious. He used to pick up the girls, you know, he... <laughs> in this jag all the girls loved a jag leather seats wooden dashboard beautiful car radio in oh it was it was the business and one <laughs> one evening we're in a, a pub and one of the lads said to him i saw your dad driving your car you, you allow him to drive your jag and he said yeah 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 my dad hasn't got a car so yeah, i let him borrow my jag now and then his name was jeff and we used to call him jeff jag and one Sunday lunchtime, I'll never forget it, one of the other lads said, I saw your dad two or three times this week driving your Jag. He said, he doesn't want to get his own car. How come he keeps borrowing yours and he's not got his own car? You know what I'm going to say, don't you? After a good six, seven, eight months of him telling us it's his Jag, it was his dad's. His dad lent him the car, <laughs> not the other way around. And it was all, it was embarrassing for everyone. I don't know why people have to do that. They make out that there's something that they're not. Look at me, the big I am. It's not a council house, I've bought it, it's mine. That's my car, that jag is mine, I lend it to my dad. I mean, you know, you're going to get caught out, aren't you? As this Jeff did, Jeff Jag. <laughs> he got caught out and his dad... This is the worst bit for him. He was a laughing stock, you know, whenever we saw him. How's your dad's car, Jeff? All right, is it? <laughs> His dad got to hear of it. And he wouldn't lend him the jag anymore. Apparently, he said to him, no, you're going around pretending it's your car. And you you, know, you lend it to me. No, you're not driving it anymore. So he had, to, <laughs> he had to buy his own car. And he bought, actually, a very nice car these days, a Moggy Minor, a Morris Thousand. And it was all right, it was rusty, it was a bit of a clapped out old thing. It was all right, though it worked. But he, he used to drive round with this Morris Minor. And one or two of the girls in the pub said, well, where's your Jag? Oh, uh, and of course, in front of us, what could he say? He just said, I sold it. Well, you bought that thing, that rust heap. <laughs> we didn't, you know, we didn't uh, muck it up by saying to the girls, oh, it's his dad's car. But that was funny. But why do people have to pretend that they are something that they aren't. I, in fact, I knew a chap, I, I must just say this, I knew a chap, you probably don't know anything about coax cable for aerials, but it could have been anything, but it was coax cable. And I said to him, people on my radio website are after coax and uh, I, I need to buy some. And I didn't have an account with this place that sold reels of coax. You buy it wholesale. 
This is when I was in business. And he said, oh, well, I, I've got, co- yeah, I've got an account with them. I can get you kayaks. I said, great, I'll have a couple of 50 metre drums of this particular type of kayaks. I'll get that for you. Yep, no problem. And the days went by. Got that coax? No, no, not yet. No, no, I've ordered it. A week, two weeks. Brian, where is the coax? I need the coax. I've got people waiting. I told these people, yes, I'm getting it. In the end, after a month or more, he came round to see me and he said, I'm sorry, I can't get coax. I don't have an account with the company. And I said, OK, uh, right. So why did you say you, you've got an account? I was trying to be big. I was trying to show off. And I, he did apologise. And I said, OK, I understand. that. That's fine. You know, no, no problem. I won't affect our friendship. And I said, no, of course it won't, Brian. No, he's gone now. Sadly, he passed away. It didn't affect our friendship. But I did think, why? You know, why pretend that, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I can get, I've got an account with them. I can get you coax at the right wholesale price. Well, he couldn't at all. I don't know. When you know about something, say you're a car mechanic or a radio and TV engineer, as I was in the old days, if someone says to you, oh, yeah, I'm a TV engineer, I'm in the old tellies, you've only got to listen to them for not even five minutes. Just ask them about a certain... Oh, do you remember the old uh, Echo, the Bush TVs? Do you remember the Bush TV 22? They were a lovely telly, weren't they? Their answer immediately tells you Either, yes, they were a TV engineer, they know exactly what you, you know, they're talking about, or <laughs> they haven't got a clue what you're talking about. It's a funny old world, isn't it? Now, I'm pretending to be a successful podcaster, <laughs> and I am, aren't I? I've got three, li- no, four listeners now. How about that worldwide, four listeners? No, seriously, I don't know how many now, but there are over 400 listeners every time I put an episode on. There's over 400. That isn't many. What's in the UK? How many people in the UK? Is it 90 million? So 400, and they're spread around the world. That's not very many, is it? How many people are in the world? How many billions of people are in the world? And I've got 400 people that listen to each episode. It doesn't matter. It's a start. What I don't do is go around saying to people, oh, yeah, I've got a a million and a half followers, of course, on my podcast episodes, because that is stupid. They won't believe it. Tina's story reminded me of something, actually. I used to go out with a girl. I'm not going to say her real name. We call her Sandra. That's good enough. Hello, Sandra. (laughs) I used to go out with her. Only as a friend, we were just friends, you know, we'd meet down the pub or I'd give her a lift somewhere. That's all we were, just friends. So although I went out with her, that's all it was. And we got more and more friendly as the weeks passed. And she told me that she was married. Well, that was fine. That, you know, it wasn't a relationship that we had like that. So that that was fine. I did say, what about your husband? Does he mind you going out? You know, I pick you up sometimes. We meet in the pub. Does he say anything? What does he think? Oh, no, he's fine. He's fine about it. Well, the thing is, now here's the thing. I happened to know her husband. I didn't realise, but I knew her husband from school many, many years previously. And I happened to bump into him. And he said, oh, Ray, he said, you're going out with my wife, aren't you? And I said, "Uh, not going out. No, we have a drink in the pub. A few other friends as well. It's not like that. And he said... (laughs) He said, I'm trying to get rid of her. And I, I said, what do you mean? What do you mean you're trying to get rid of her? He said, well, I, you know, I don't want to be with her anymore. I don't want to upset her. And I'm trying to get her to go off with someone else. So she leaves me rather than I have to leave her. And I explained to him several times. I said, we're not going out. I said, we all meet in the pub, a group of friends. Sometimes I'll pick her up if the weather's bad or we just all meet in the pub. And I said to him that she's told me she's married. I said, I didn't realise it was you, but uh, you know now I know. Uh, I'm just explaining to you that there is nothing in it. I said, you, why do you want to get rid of her? He had someone else. They'd been married 10 years. He had someone else, uh, as he put it. I'll never forget his words. I've got someone else lined up. <laughs> OK, right, I don't know what that means quite. I didn't inquire further. I didn't want to know, to be honest. I didn't want to get involved in any of this weird stuff. So he said, are you interested in her? And I said, no, <laughs> no, not at all. I don't want to be in, in part of this at all, no. 
And he said, OK, well, keep meeting her in the pub. I'm hoping she'll meet someone. And I said, but she appears to be happy with you. You know, why would she go off with someone? I think he was a bit balmy, actually. I don't think that he thought this through properly. He thought that if she kept going to the pub, she'd end up finding someone and going out with someone. He initially thought that it was me that she'd taken a shine to and perhaps we were going to go off together or something. No, 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 no way. She had said to me on several occasions that her husband didn't like going out. He wasn't one for the pub at all. He hated it, but he was quite happy for her to go. Of course, now I realised why he was quite happy. He was hoping she'd meet someone else. Rather bizarre, the whole situation. <laughs> I didn't tell her or any of the, the crowd that we were with about seeing her husband and what he'd said. I just didn't tell her anything because basically it was none of my business. I didn't want to know. And it was one evening, we were all in the pub, about eight of us, and she said to me, oh, by the way, I've met someone else. <laughs> and I immediately thought, well, wow, this is going to be his dream come true. It's exactly what her husband wanted. So I said, oh, OK, well, what about your husband? And she said, he doesn't care. I think he wants me to meet someone else. I was tempted to tell her that I'd spoken to him, but again, I didn't want to get involved. And then she said that she had been looking for someone else for months and months. She'd hoped it would be me, but it, nothing had happened, nothing clicked. Uh, which I didn't want it to anyway. Anyway, she said that she wanted to leave him and was hoping he'd find someone else. I think both of them were slightly, what's that record, touched in the head, Angie Baby. They were both a little touched. I don't think they quite knew what they wanted or what they were doing. The long and the short of it, or is it the tall and the short or the long? <laughs> I get these things mixed up. The long and the short of it, isn't it? Eventually, they did split up and they both went off with other people. But what a strange situation. It was most peculiar. I don't know. I've never known anything like it. I've known people that have cheated on each other and I knew one chap. He was married and he had this other girl that he was seeing sort of on the side. And his wife found out and left him, chucked him out of the house. That was that. So he sort of took up with this other girl, moved in with her. And he was then, after a couple of years, I just said, you know, how is she? Oh, she chucked me out. <laughs> because he'd had someone else. I think he was a serial womanizer or whatever the term is. He was crazy. He was always on about women and, oh, dear. Anyway, he ended up with one lady. He's getting on, but this time, you know, he's 60 years old. And he ended up with her and he stuck with her behaved himself he's probably too old to do anything else and uh, he did say to me at last I found happiness and you know a couple of years later after that after he'd said to me he found happiness I think he was 60 something he passed away so he spent all his life I'd known him since my teens all his life womanizing as they call it finally settled down and then uh, wasn't able to enjoy it I don't know. You've got to be careful, haven't you, these days? You never know what's around the next corner. That's the trouble. One chap I knew, I knew him from, uh, not school, but just after school when I first went to work in my teens, mid-teens. He never had a girlfriend. Now, at the time, back in the 60s, people were saying, oh, we think he's gay. He wasn't gay at all. He never had a girlfriend. The years went by, decades went by, and I still know him now. Never got married. And he has said to me on the odd occasion, I'm not gay, I just never met the right person. Didn't meet anyone, let alone the right person. I think he has had one or two girlfriends, but nothing ever came of it, really. He lived with his mum for years. She eventually passed away, and then he lived on his own. And he's quite happy that way, so perhaps that's just meant to be, I don't know. I don't think now, as he has said, if he met someone, he couldn't live with someone now. He's lived on his own for so long... It just, I don't know, it wouldn't work. In fact, I know a couple of people like that and they both said similar things. One said, the other one, he said to me, I wish I had married years ago, but I never met anyone because I'm lonely now. That's sad, isn't it? He is older than, what's he now? He must be heading for 80 years old, I think. I don't know, I, can't, I just know he's older than me. But he's lonely. What a shame that is, isn't it? Just going back to the big I am for a minute, there was this chap that uh, us sort of crowd 
we weren't a gang, it was just a, a group of us, eight, ten people, used to meet in the pub. And this one chap who had joined us, we didn't know much about him, but over the weeks we got to know him and he was kind of part of our crowd. He said that he was a millionaire. And of course we're all sniggering you know, behind his back. <laughs> yeah, right, it's a millionaire. He had an old car, a bit of a wreck old car. He did have his own house, nothing to speak of. It was a bungalow, I think, nothing to speak of. His clothes weren't particularly smart or anything. Just an ordinary chap. He worked at a, an electrical wholesale, you know, selling electrical house wiring stuff, cable. He just worked there, just behind the counter at the wholesaler. And we used to say, you know, behind his back, if he was a millionaire, he wouldn't work there. You know, he'd have a decent car. And Anyway, after, after a few weeks, I suppose, no months, one of us, one evening, one of us, uh, this chap, he said, uh, if you're a millionaire, you know, what are you working at that place for? And he said, well, something to do, to be honest. What else do I do? I'll be bored. He wasn't, how old was he? In his 30s, single in his 30s. And he just said, well, I'd be bored. What else would I do? And of course, we were saying, well, well, you know, you could buy a car like this. You could have holidays. You could do this. You could do that. All the things that we would do if we had a, a few million quid, you know. Anyway, it turned out that he actually was a millionaire. He owned property somewhere in London. Now, going back, uh, 80s, was it? I can't remember. And he owned property in London that was rented out. His aunt or someone had left him a fortune and he was literally a millionaire. Amazing. <laughs> I won't go into how we found out about all that, but uh, there was a chap in the pub that knew of him and he was a solicitor and all this stuff. So it was genuine. He was a genuine millionaire. That's amazing, isn't it? I did ask him at some stage when we were alone. I said to him, you know, why tell people you're a millionaire? Because you don't look like one. By the look of your car, you wouldn't think you're a millionaire or your clothes, you know, with all due respect. And he said, oh, I don't know. I'd had a few drinks. I shouldn't have told you a lot. Had a few drinks that night and just said, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> he was a lovely chap. I lost touch with him in the end because he moved to Australia. So he's, uh, he's, he's older than me, 10 years older than me. He might be still around probably millionaireing out there, whatever you do with a load of money. People are funny, aren't they? What I used to like in my early, early days was sitting in the pub, just on my own, sit at a table and look at the people up at the bar and listen to them. All the different characters. I used to people watch. That's what they call it, isn't it? When I have to go to Butlins, oh, here we go, in February, guess where I'm going? Well, I've just told you, Butlins again. The last couple of times I've been there, I've come back with COVID. And Trish said I haven't. The first time we had breakfast, I wasn't at Butlins. I went over and joined everyone in a cafe for breakfast. And they all say, oh, that's where you got COVID. I wasn't even at Butlins, but no, no, no. What it was, they bought COVID from there to the cafe where I got it. The second time I got back from Butlins, I had been there the whole weekend. I felt dreadful. I'm sure it was COVID. I tested after a week or so, and it was negative. With all due respect to Butlins, whenever I go there, I seem to get COVID. And I went online, I went on Twitter, when it was called Twitter. What's it now? X or something. That's daft. Twitter was brilliant. Why call it X? Anyway, whatever. So I went on Twitter, and I put Butlins COVID. And there's loads of comments on there. I got COVID from Butlins. Oh, I'm not going to Butlins. I got COVID. It's not Butlin's fault, it's all the people tightly mixing together, isn't it? You know, all in and out of doors, holding handles, holding handrails on the stairs, holding everything, wiping their faces and coughing over people. You know, it spreads. Covid, it's like the flu, isn't it? So anyway, I've got to go in February. I don't know what to do. I think I'll stay outside in the fresh air. I'll get a sleeping bag and a tent and sleep out on the lawn in front of the hotel. <laughs> I don't know. I've got to go. I did say, though, to everyone, Trish, her sister, I've said to everyone, if I get COVID after going there this time, whether it's from Butlins or a cafe we go to in town or wherever, then I'm never going again. That's my ultimatum. I hope I don't get COVID. But if I do, at least I'll never have to go there again. <laughs> That's the way I look at it anyway. I think the COVID I had on both occasions, if it was COVID, I don't know. It was very mild. I just felt a bit rough. 
for a couple of weeks, a week, two weeks, something like that. Just felt a bit rough. Obviously, I could have picked it up from anywhere, but uh, I like to say it was from there so I don't have to go again. <laughs> I'll have to pretend I've got it. Here's the thing. When I get back, pretend I'm ill. Then I'll know. <laughs> no, I can't do that. Trisha will see through me. I can't lie to her. She'll know. She'll know instantly. Next week, this is what I'm looking forward to. Next week, Trisha is having a cooking week doing all the Christmas cooking, mince pies and cakes and all the things full of calories to make me fat. She said the other day, I think I'm a feeder. And I said, well, no, you're not a feeder. I'm an eater. <laughs> so I just love all her cooking. The stuff she does, lemon biscuits and ginger cakes. Oh, it's just wonderful. She does ease off the cakes. I don't think she's cooked a cake now for quite some weeks because I just pig the whole lot. I can't help it. It's like a packet of biscuits. Some people will say, I can have a couple of biscuits out of the packet. Yes, I'll have one or two biscuits. Me, I have to eat the packet. Once it's open, at least half the packet, if not the whole packet of biscuits, has gone. <laughs> There's only me. <laughs> so next week, I've got to keep way out of the kitchen, well out of the way, because all this cooking is going on. She's bought all the ingredients. Now that takes me back to when I was a child, when I was a boy. When mums were mums and housewives and stuff like that, my mum used to do the cooking, especially coming up to Christmas. She would do the mince pies. These days, people go out and buy it all. I know some people cook, but I think the majority go and buy all the stuff. Do you buy stuff? Raise rants at protonmail.com. In the old days, mums would cook it all. Her own Christmas pudding. I remember this Christmas pudding every year. She'd make this Christmas pudding thing put it in a what looked like a pillowcase, an old Terry nappy. No, it wasn't a nappy. Put it in this pillowcase thing or a bit of a sheet and stick it in this, was it in the boiling water or hang it above the boiling water and it would be steaming and bubbling or whatever it did all day, all day long. And there were mince pies and cakes, Christmas cake, always made her own Christmas cake, as Trish does these days. There was a lot of home cooking back then, wasn't there? I liked it. You go around the supermarket now, midsummer, you're in your shorts, t shirt, flip flops. I don't wear flip flops. I can't. I hate flip flops. The noise they make is awful as you walk along. Plus, that bit between your toes irritates me. But you're in the supermarket midsummer and they're getting out the mince pies ready for Christmas. <laughs> well, not quite midsummer, late summer, put it that way. Not even autumn, and they're putting out Christmas stuff. It is such a shame that people don't, I suppose they haven't got time to do their own cooking, have they? they they're they working and a lot of people only get a couple of days off at Christmas. It's, it's difficult, isn't it, I suppose? Whereas in the old days, the mums didn't go to work. Well, my mum did. She did a bit of cleaning round at the school. Trisha's mum did. Wasn't a full-time job, but just for a little bit of extra money. At four o'clock, the school kicked out. What my mum would do is come round only round the corner, literally round the corner from where we lived, I'd be with her while she did the cleaning. Then we'd walk home, just round the corner. I don't know what she got paid for that, but it was a little bit of pocket money for her. It all helped. I don't know any mums, when I was at school, I don't know any of the kids, mums, that went to work full-time. They all had part-time jobs. Some of them worked in the kitchen at our school, for example. Some were cleaners at the school, some did other things. I don't know of any mums back then that worked nine to five, you know, full-time career-type jobs. Perhaps some of them did. I suppose some of them must have done, I don't know. My sister-in-law's gone off to Cyprus, to Paphos. Rather nice. I've been there. Have you been to Cyprus? Rather nice. I don't know, where are we? Uh, yes, it's November, isn't it? Won't be too hot out there. When we went, the last time we went there... It was, it was dreadful. It was like being in the desert. It really was dreadful. I, I don't know what it was in centigrade, but it was kind of over 100 Fahrenheit. And there's the tomb of the kings. We went down there under the ground where it was cool. When we came out of there, the heat hit you. Lovely, though. I love Cyprus. They've never been there. Sister and brother-in-law have never been there. So that should be interesting. They landed a couple of hours ago, I think. They've only gone for a week. My parents went there oh, decades ago and it snowed. It was summer and it snowed. And the locals were saying this is the first time we've had snow in 20 years. I think it was autumn, thinking back, if I remember correctly. It snowed in Cyprus. How about that? 
the first time, well, the only time they went there, didn't go again. They were expecting sort of the heat and stuff and it snowed. But it's a lovely place, Cyprus. We're not going abroad again. We can't be bothered, to be honest. Airports and all that. Oh, it's just dreadful. We go to the Isle of Wight. <laughs> it's cheaper and nearer. Talking of cafes, as I was earlier about Butlins, I used to go to a cafe when I was 15 and first went to work as an apprentice. There was a caf round the corner. And we used to go around there and have breakfast 10 o'clock in the morning. Started work, was it half eight, I think. 10 o'clock when the boss had disappeared out on whatever he did, mending tellies, we'd go around the caf. <laughs> there was one called Bun and Joe's. Who remembers Bun and Joe's in Worthing? Not far from Worthing Central Station. And another cafe opposite the Central Station, the south side, the Slip-In Caf. We used to go there as well. And have breakfast, not not you know on the same day. We didn't go to one then the other and have two breakfasts, but we'd alternate. The slip in calf and bun and Joe's that was great. Then we go over to Hobden's Bakery. That's still there. That's still going, and we buy cheese rolls and <laughs> cakes and things. Of course, back then when I was fifteen, sixteen, all my teens, I could eat what I liked. Didn't put any weight on. I was always twelve stone. I don't know what that is in, in your money, pounds and kilos and stuff, 12 stone. I was 12 stone from when I was kind of mid-teens to, I think, late 20s, 12 stone. And then, creeping up to my 30s and beyond, I started getting heavier. <laughs> and uh, yes, anyway, I won't tell you what I am now. Well, I will. I'm 16 stone now, but I've got height. I'm six foot two, so I've got a bit of height. But uh, I do want to lose some weight. I'm going to lose some weight for Christmas. How many of you are saying that? I'm going to lose a few pounds for Christmas. I expect a lot of people are saying that. And the New Year's, oh, the New Year's resolution, we've got that coming. I don't do that. I don't do all this. Oh, come January the 1st. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to do that. And I'll stop. Oh, no, 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 no. Because it doesn't work, does it? By the 3rd, 4th, 5th of January, oh, forget that. That didn't work. I can't be bothered with that. I haven't got time for this. <laughs> but I will try and lose a few pounds if I can for Christmas. Well, we've already got, uh, how long have we got? What's the date today? No, we've got a few weeks yet. Yes, I've got time. That's all right. I've got time to lose a, a few pounds. My son was saying the other day that uh, I shouldn't eat bread. I said, I only have a couple of slices of bread a day. Homemade bread, it's lovely. You shouldn't have two slices a week, let alone a day. He said, you shouldn't have any or potatoes, or this, or that. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I can't eat anything. I will get thin, I shall lose stone after stone. I did lose, uh, what was I? I was, um, I was 14 stone a couple of years ago. And I put on this two stone and it won't go away. But he, he tells me off. <laughs> you shouldn't drink this, you should. He says, you don't need beer. I don't drink a lot of beer. Oh, you shouldn't have any beer. Now, here's the thing, he says. Here's the thing. No potatoes, no bread, no beer, no this, no that, no nothing. There's nothing. That's like that record, isn't it? I'm turning Japanese, I really think so. By the vapours, do you know that? What is it? No no sex, no fun, no something, no nothing. <laughs> no wonder I'm bored. Or, no, I can't remember the lyrics. But uh, he's right, you know, if I want to lose weight. I did once, for a few weeks, have no bread or potatoes. Just those two things I cut out totally. And I did lose quite a few pounds. It was amazing. The thing is, <laughs> now here's the thing, cheese sandwiches, homemade brown bread, cheese sandwiches. We've got homemade pick a lily. Oh, that on a cheese sa in a cheese sandwich. How can I stop bread? And potatoes. I like baked potato, jacket potato. Look, I'm making you all hungry now with cheese. Oh, wonderful. I can't stop all that. He'll be tell he listens to this. He'll be contacting me from North Carolina saying, I told you not to eat bread. You've been eating bread. <laughs> anyway, listen, I'm going to clear off. Now I've made you all hungry. You'll all be going to the fridge or the cupboard and snacking and grazing. That's the problem, isn't it? Snacking and grazing. I, I don't, I try not to do that. If we're getting near meal time, if it's approaching meal time and we're a bit late for whatever reason, I do tend to pick at things. I try to have things like a carrot or a piece of cucumber or a glass of water because that's that's not too bad, is it? A lettuce leaf for dinner. <laughs> now, OK, I'm going to disappear. 
Take care. I will see you on Wednesday with the midweek message. Don't go and raid the fridge, because if you put on a few pounds, you'll blame me. Look after yourselves. Keep healthy. Stay warm this winter. Or if you're in Australia... Now, who was it said to me they in Australia? 40 degrees in the bush, in the outback. 40 degrees C. Struth. That's hot, isn't it? Take care. See you Wednesday. Bye-bye for now.